All right. <coughs> okay. So I won't um, do official material until 10 after, but um, in the meantime, we might look at the news if I can figure out how to operate my computer. All right. So, uh, all right. See if there's anything fun in the news. I think there was. Okay. This one's good. Uh, that's entertaining. So is that. Yeah, there's stuff here kind of worth looking at. Um, was he? Yeah, well, he... Yeah, sounds pretty impressive. So he found... Um, let's see, somewhere. There. That's him. He does put some kind of hardware in the Amazon lock and now when the guy comes in to deliver the package he is able to get in after that guy so he doesn't explain how it works because he's waiting for amazon to patch it so it i'm guessing it's doing something like recording the signals that unlock the door so we can play them back but it could be doing a variety of things but anyway now the amazon guy comes and goes and now the bad guy can get in so that's pretty good So that's good, clean fun. And uh, we'll probably learn more about that if, after Amazon patches it. Um, so I don't recommend doing this at home. <laughs> this guy made gene-altered viral therapy to cure his herpes. And before testing on animals, he just injected himself live at a conference. This is uh, Frankenstein stuff, not recommended, uh, perhaps not even legal, certainly not the AMA recommended way to do things. They say this kind of genetic therapy has not been approved anywhere for any purpose, and this guy is a wild lunatic. <coughs> so, <clears throat> we'll see. Um, China has had it with Bitcoin, and they are blocking access to Bitcoin exchange sites from inside China with the Great Firewall of China, which is not surprising to me. I mean, Bitcoin is almost all scams. China has... No particular interest in letting people speculate with money anyway. It's kind of contradictory to their philosophy, so uh, we'll see what happens. Um, if they stop the mining, that'll greatly affect the price of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is falling, stock market's falling, you know. Um, yeah, Dow went down a lot. Yeah, Wozniak sold his Bitcoin. So this one I, I was glad to see. I saw this a few days ago. I didn't know who it was. There was the Eternal Blue was the exploit that worked only on certain versions of Windows and was used by some big viruses, uh, ransomware. But this guy ported it all to Metasploit and modified it so it works on every version of Windows. Eternal Champion, Eternal Romance, and Eternal Synergy. And I know Eternal Romance is great. These others are probably good too. So that's good, clean fun. It'll patch anything that hasn't been updated since about March almost a year ago now, all this stuff was patched by Microsoft back then. So this came up a while ago, now came back again. The White House staff is ordered to use nothing but official whitehouse.gov email for everything so it can all be archived, and therefore they can't use any encrypted chat apps. This contradicts what Trump told everyone to do about six or eight months ago. Everybody was leaking everything. So he told everyone to start using encrypted apps so that they wouldn't be as easy to leak. But I think after that book by Wolf came out, he kind of spilled the beans on what we all knew anyway, which is most of the leaks come straight from Trump. And it's the rest of his staff, they're all stabbing each other in the back. So as soon as something happens, whoever is the opponent or whoever just got embarrassed leaks it all. And this is the true of many royal palaces. The, they try to embarrass each other in the jockeying for power. And so everything that happens gets leaked by the other people. That's right. I'm just amazed. The New York Times seems to have everything about a half hour after it happens in the White House. So they're all just leaking like crazy. And uh, Trump tries to pretend it's the FBI doing it, but it's not the FBI. Yeah. It's a strange uh, thing. One place, one agency, dictate that, that data has to be kept 
Yeah. Years, things like that. And, and whether you encrypt it. And if you're 50 years, most of us know how to be. Oh, well, yeah, it's just a presidential record requirement, which predates electronic communication and cell phones and encryption and everything. You're supposed to, the original plan, I think, was it all would be on paper, and you have to archive the paper. And that's why everything that happens in the White House is supposed to be recorded so it can be examined later. I don't really know, but I know there's the presidential library, all the papers are kept forever. And like they just declassified stuff from 50 years ago about the Vietnam War and stuff. So, I mean, it's all part of history and everything. And it's all got to be available in case of lawsuits or Freedom of Information Acts and all that requests and all that jazz. That's why if you start using something that's not recorded, it's illegal. And that's what the Republicans tried to hurt Hillary Clinton for, by using a private email server like Yahoo or her own personal email server. It was not archived correctly, and that was a violation of law. So we'll see what comes of it all. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a bit extreme even for the uh, Republicans. Um, and anything else fun? This one's kind of amazing. All right, so here's a few more. Um, so the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Board, the Republicans think it just should not exist. Uh, they put a guy in charge who has said there should be no consumer protections. Uh, it is wrong for the government to do this. It violates the pro-business position of GOP. And so they're abandoning the Equifax probe. So there won't be any punishment for Equifax for losing all that data, um, which is a little extreme even for a Republican administration. It usually is uh, the old rule, caveat emptor, it's your own fault for letting someone rip you off. The government should not be involved. Um, so CoinCheck got hacked, stole half a billion dollars as just the latest of hundreds of Bitcoin hacks and exchanges hacks. So uh, people are beginning to, I think people are beginning to realize what a complete scam cryptocurrency is. <laughs> it's the luster is off and it's now become clear that all the pump of Bitcoin from 300 up to $20,000 was completely fake, engineered by Bitfinex who made a fake coin called Tether that pretended to be tied to a dollar, but it wasn't. And then when they bought vast amounts of Bitcoin with that, they counted the price as if it was dollars to fool suckers into paying real dollars for it. And it's, uh, it's all just a giant pump and dump scam or a pyramid scheme, which is what pretty much everybody involved in the financial industry seriously has thought of cryptocurrencies all along. And a lot of people are fed up with it. I think Visa and MasterCard have now blocked using their credit cards to buy cryptocurrencies everybody is beginning to realize that this is just garbage. Uh, and uh, there's now a federal investigation of Bitfinex to show how they pumped Bitcoin up to 20,000. I mean, Bitcoin got up to 10,000. I say, this is impossible. And it is impossible. This is actually kind of amazing. The new imaging system, you make a lens out of ground glass that has random scratches. And then by moving the light, you mathematically calculate exactly how the little random things are moving it, and you end up getting a much more precisely focused image than you can with a normal lens. Um, by using this random pattern that is carefully designed to have like three steps randomly. It's, uh, it's interesting, and I think this is related to adaptive optics. Uh, in the, a couple of decades ago, the best way to get a picture of a galaxy was to put a satellite up like Hubble and take a picture to get out of the atmosphere. But then people figured out, wait a minute, we could follow one star and watch how the air moves it around and compensate for that on a computer and sharpen the image with what they call adaptive optics, where you move the mirror to follow one star. And they found out that makes pictures from the ground through the air more accurate than pictures from space through Hubble. And this is the same kind of thing. A random ground glass would be as good as a lens if you could use computer processing to precisely match the shape of the glass. And that's what they're doing now. So um, it sounds pretty awesome. And we'll see how it goes. Anyway, now we're up to the official uh, time here. I do have one thing I want to show you before we just go upstairs for practice. Um, I had some students doing Pico CTF last week. And they said they didn't know how to script anything. They were trying to do everything by using websites to do base 64 and stuff. And so it occurred to me, a lot of people here have not taken 124. 
and therefore don't know any scripting at all, and there's no need to put up with that. So I figured I would give you the basic violent Python stuff to do. And in the meantime, I went, I looked at some guy's web class and he had another way to do it that's easier. So I made a project here, Python, with um, how to use the requests library. And I just plan to show you this and show me you can do this. You should learn this much Python. So first you put Python on your computer. I put a link on the 140 page. If you want to use Python on Windows, you can even do that. If for some perverse reason you actually want to use Windows, you can put Python on Windows. Um, but if you use a Mac or Linux, it's already on there. And once you have something with Python on it, which could be a, a, a virtual machine or a real machine, you can now do pretty much anything. Python is so easy, you don't really need to know any programming. So um, let's clear. Right. All you do is type Python. Oh, first you have to install the requests library. And for that, all you have to do is pip install requests. For some reason, it's not included by default, although I think it's included by default with column. But pip will install it. After you have Python, and it tells me I've already got it, which is fine. So, all right, now you start Python this way. Just type Python. Now you can write scripts and save them as text files and run them, but you don't even have to for simple things in Python. You can just execute commands right at the Python shell the way you execute bash or DOS commands. And that's good enough for a lot of what we're doing here. So you import requests, and this gives you the HTTP requests library, which is really nice. It makes it very easy to do HTTP. So if you wanted to load my page, for example, you can just do this, requests.get, that will do an HTTP get, then you just put in the URL. And the one thing that I love is you can use HTTPS websites and it's fine. The way I used to do it was the sockets, and if you use HTTPS, it's a problem. But this is not, it'll load a page, it's gonna get an object, including the contents of that page, and put it in a variable called R. In the fullness of time, which I assume must be the slowness of the City College network. On the staff network, it should be as fast as it's gonna get, but it sure doesn't seem to move much. Um, let's see if I have any internet or what. Ping. I seem to have internet. Oh, there it finally responds. It's just very, very slow. Okay. So, no, it just doesn't respond at all. Swell. Um, right. Maybe I need to get off the City College staff and use the student guest network. Often that works better. Let's try that. The, uh, all right. I don't know what's going on with the network here, but it always seems to be messed up. Um, right. <coughs> All right. I don't know what's going on. Let's see if I can get this thinking thing to work. Ping google.com. Okay. Python. Okay. Import requests. Get my web page and don't take forever about it. Right. Maybe it can't do HTTPS. I don't know what the nonsense is here. Um, uh, I just did this in a coffee house and it was fine. I'm beginning to think I just need to go through my iPad because I don't know what the world is wrong with this network, but there's always something wrong with this network. Let's try that. Somewhere just one of these cables. Okay. Um very strange. Did I spell it wrong or something? Requests.get? No, it just sits there forever without doing anything. All right. Uh, let me try to connect through my iPad and see if something will work around here. Yeah. 
Yes. <coughs> yes. Waiting for my iPad to respond. All right. Off I say. Okay. Personal. Let me get rid of this. There's no hotspot on. USB only. That was my plan. Okay. Now, uh, let's exit pinggoogle.com. Okay. Theoretically, I'm connected through my iPad. Let me see if it shows any sign of working. Um, Wi-Fi is connected, but the iPhone USB is not connected, which is mighty strange because it's connected. Um, Bluetooth pen, iPad USB, not connected. That is a strange thing for you to say when you're connected. Uh, it keeps popping up some nonsense about trusting this computer or something. Uh-huh. Maybe nothing is going to work here, and I just have to go up to the lab. I don't know why none of these networks work. Oh, because there's no stinking cell phone signal in this room. Um, if I get rid of the... Yeah, it's going to do this blinking trust nonsense, which it likes to do. All right, so the iPad is not going to work, and the Wi-Fi is not going to work. Uh, all right. Um, Python, uh, one more time and then I'm just going to give up and go up to the lab and see if anything works up there because I can't demonstrate this project here because it just doesn't work for no apparent reason. HTTPS, let's try google.com. That's one thing I don't like about this, I can't see what's wrong. Yeah, and it just sits there forever without doing it. If I use a non-HTTPS page, I should be able to see in Wireshark what's going on. And maybe I can find out what the problem is. But I think it's got to be the City College Network because I've been doing it all day and it works everywhere else. It's got to be some exotic way to break the City College Network. Uh, let's have... TCP port equals equals 80 and run this and see neat it doesn't even send anything out port 80 so it's not even trying or else I'm not sniffing on the right adapter um, wait something happened oh cool it finally moved I think it's got to just okay good um, so let's see what I got. R.data should be the page. Uh, all right. Um, let's see. I thought it was data. What is it? R.headers. Print R.headers. It loaded a page with 1,491 bytes. And somewhere in here should be the status code. Um, R.status code will show it. Good. So it's finally moving. It was just some kind of, yeah, status code is 200. Okay. And now someplace I can see the data, r.text. Okay. Print r.text. Okay. So I don't, there we are. And that shows you the HTML of the page. Now, I should be able to load an HTTPS page too. So let's try that. Because this thing is, doesn't care whether it's HTTP or HTTPS. And we'll see if it responds in any reasonable amount of time or not. Right. Well, let's leave that going forever and move on. Um, you can see all the methods of R. R is an object that has all the parts of page. And if you print the directory of R, it'll show you all the stuff. Here's header and there's JSON. If it's JavaScript object notation, it comes back and so on. Here's text and URL. You can see all the things there. So here is a page to try logging in at. And let's see if that will load over our network here or not. 
All right, the page loads. Now I can log in here with say A and B. And when I submit it, it tells me I'm, I've failed. Now you can find out what's going on with these requests with view developer tools. And the developer tools has a network tab that will record network events in the browser. This is the right way to do it and not Wireshark because if it's HTTPS, you can't see anything in Wireshark. Everything is encrypted. This way you can see requests even if they're going over HTTPS like this one is. So if I send A and B and submit it, it shows me here the network and I'm gonna try and zoom in. Yeah, the developer tools won't zoom in. I can zoom in here for the students that are seeing it live, but I think from previous experience, this zoom in doesn't affect the zoom people connecting over the internet. As far as I can tell, um, you're pretty much hosed seeing small things in zoom. Um, there is no way to make this bigger that I can figure out. I wonder if I can lower my Mac resolution. I'm just gonna give it a try because I know the zoom is pretty hard to see. Um, and, ah, that might work better. Yeah, all right, good. That might make it somewhat less invisible. So let's try and get this junk out of my way. All right, so here's cookie login. If you click on that, you will see the request. This is the URL, HTTPS, games, the name of the folder, the name of the PHP page, and then the parameters go here. So that URL is what you have to fetch to log in. And it did it with a get. So you can do this with the same method that we used here. Ah, and this request does eventually actually move here. So I can print r.data, or r.text, sorry. And you'll see the contents of my web page. So I can now do the same thing to log in. For logging in with a get request, everything is just right here in the URL. So that somehow I didn't get it all. It's cookie login, copy I say, all right. And somehow it did not paste correctly. Yeah, that is pretty messed up. You copy and paste and it doesn't come out right. How rude. Many, many things are not working today. Yeah, when I paste it here, it works, but when I paste it in there, it doesn't work. This is uh, very rude, and I don't know why, but I can just succeed by going, putting it in, in two pieces. Whoa, all right. I think it's probably wrapping around is what it is. I think Python does something goofy when it's too long. Um, so let me do it this, which is probably a good thing for you to see anyway. A equals... That's part of it, okay. B equals the other part of it. Um, there, this is, all right. Now, let's C equal A plus B and print C. Okay, there is the actual, whoa, I did it backwards, didn't I? I better do C equals B plus A. Okay. Now let's try looking at C. Okay, that is the URL I want to resolve. Now let's make R equals requests. Come on, stop that. Dot get of uh, C. And I think that will do it. That should log in with A and B. And the result in R.text should tell me that A and B are the wrong password. And we will see. When in the fullness of time it responds. And I guess I've learned it just takes 45 seconds for the City College Network to send a get request for some unknown reason. <coughs> and when I get really bored, I start another one here. So let's Get another one going while we're waiting for the first one to not respond. Um, import requests. All right, so um, that will eventually respond. And now I can go back and try to log in with the right name and password. Now, if you go back here, it's not like it's a secret or anything. i will be some way to get this thing to stay off the screen. Anyway, um, down here, root and tor are the right password. So let's construct the 
page that will be root and tor. I'm going to do it in two pieces because Python is giving me trouble. Um, I can make this bigger. Okay, so the name is root and the password is tor. All right, so my glorious script is going to be this first. So let's go back to here. And that's still taking forever to respond, so we'll just keep going. A equals this. B equals this. All right, C equals A plus B. Print C. Okay, M and R equals requests dot get of C. There. And now, for some reason, it actually answers. So I can print r.text, and I can see um, this is a successful login because it said, welcome Linux root user, which is what it says when you log in successfully. So that I can now log in programmatically by doing our requests. Now, the reason why this is cool, because you can log in right in the browser, and that works. The reason why this is good is because now you can break into websites. Because now that you can do it with a script, you can try a list of names and passwords until you get in. So, here is a login page. Available as cookie login page, right? I did that before, login. This is the one where you do welcome Linux root user. That's the one I showed you. So here's the first challenge. Here is a Hey, login form is missing from this page. That's irritating. I'll have to add it back in the page. Somehow I lost it. Um, I'll skip that for the moment. We'll go down to this one. All right, so here's how you loop in Python. So this one is frozen forever. Okay, I think I'm getting a clue here. Like some of the requests just get lost in our network and others don't. So if you just, anyway. Um, so down here is a login form, and I user is Bill, Ted, Sally, or Sue. And the pass pin is a two-digit number. So if I log in as Bill, and I try the pin of 00, zero then it's going to tell me credentials rejected. Okay. Now I want to see how that happened. So I go to developer tools, and I log in again. And now I can see what happened here. And it used a post. It went to this place, login2.php, and it sent parameters, username bill and password 00. So we can, if we can make a post request go in a program, we can then try all the combinations of username and password until we get in. So there are a few techniques you need to know. The first thing is how to make a loop. So if I want to do a loop through text values, I do I in square bracket app a apple baker cat like that now whenever you make a loop in python you end with a colon and now you indent the things that are in the loop so i'm going to print i and you end it with two character terms now it runs the loop and it prints apple baker cat this is how you loop through text values if you want to loop through numerical values in range of one to three, colon, print I, enter, enter, and now it prints from one to two. It doesn't do the last one. It does up until, as long as you're less than the last one. So now you should know how to loop letters and numbers. Now you can try these logins. So the login for this is that URL, which I'm gonna copy and I'm gonna paste it into a text editor. Okay, that's the URL, and I want to do it with post. So it's going to be r equals requests dot post of that. Yes, a single quote will do. Um, doesn't really matter. Okay, now that would be a post, but I want to also have parameters. And the parameters are, that thing is really... Annoying, the way it constantly pops up to get in the way. Anyway, um, the posts are, here is an example of a post. And I'd close that if I could reach it there. You send a post, and then you put data equals in these curly braces. 
And remember the data, uh, was in that pane I just closed. I'm gonna have to bring it back again. Let me start with this one. Data equals u equals root p equals password. So here I'm gonna have, to, inside here, I'm gonna have to have data equals that stuff. And now you have name value pairs, like username, colon, root, and then a comma for the next one, p is the name and colon, the value is password. There, it'd be something like that. Now, what I want is I need to get the right names of these fields and the right values to put in them. So let's try this login again here with bill and zero, zero, and view it in developer tools again, because I had to clear that to get it off the screen. Here's developer tools again, I submit, and here it tells me it is U and P, bill and zero, zero. So I want U a bill and P of zero, zero. That will attempt to log in as bill. That is the single line of Python that I need to, whoa, whoa, something bad happened. It changed into capitals in my text editor, which uh, is pretty evil. Ah, good, I can undo it. So, um, that's the line of Python I need to execute to do that request to try to log in. Let's see if that'll work. Hey, it actually copied without fouling up for once. And now, it even responded without spending forever, good. Print r.text. Gotta spell text correctly though. All right, now, credentials rejected. So, I, all you have to do is make a loop and try all the usernames and all the passwords until you get in. And there are a few other challenges. Um, you have to make two loops if you want to do it all at once, or you can do each username separately, and you have to put out the output into something you can hunt through because you're going to get 400 rejected and one of them is not rejected. But those are problems I imagine you can solve, and I'm happy to help you solve them up there. Um, here, it's telling me network is unreachable. It appears to be unable to reach my website. Perhaps City College is blocking my website again. They like to do that. Um, but they don't see me blocking it from a browser. Anyway, um, I think we just have an unreliable network here, which is pretty normal. Um, that's what I wanted to show you. Aside from all the difficulties on the network, you should be able to script things. And we do in these CTFs, it helps a lot to be able to break little scripts. So are there any questions about anything? So you gotta do practice tonight. I'm gonna to be recording that you did some practice and what I'd like you to do is solve this, this puzzle. Find the login here. There's 400 options and you should be able to do them. It should be easily achievable tonight and I can help you. And if you know how to do it, it'll be easy. And you can just go on and do more Pico CTFs or something. Uh, we are right on track. I don't know if I got to tell you last time in this class, um, I think we are looking very good for competing this semester because I went to the conference call about this event, National Cyber League, and it was very clear that there is no preparation material at all prepared for the other coaches, and they have no idea how to prepare. Um, all the materials are unavailable and 10 years out of date also. They're not even gonna have the gymnasium available until March 30, so we're gonna have plenty of time to get ready because we can do um, easy CTF starting next week, and we should. So do Pico CTF, and Easy CTF is coming up, and after that come more and more Easy CTFs, Angstrom CTF, and uh, another one, Are You Secure? These are all high school level CTFs, so they should be not too hard, and they're just at the right level to prepare us for the real NCL contest. So um, we should be well prepared. Well, other people are kind of devoid of any preparation materials, which would run to our benefit. Although I did mention it in the chat, it was pretty clear that people were sort of confused and not getting it. So I don't know what in the world the other teams are going to do, but I think we're going to be sitting pretty. So um, yeah. These are all real competitions, but we are not eligible to win the prizes because we're colleges. These are intended for high schools. High school students will actually win like a cash prize. <laughs> You talk, you talk about this registration stuff? He was asking what the gym is, right? The gym is some kind of online net lab type environment to work in. Uh, that's their supposed preparation environment. And um, people were in fact complaining about that, but I haven't even ever gotten in to see what it is. Apparently when we get in, it's going to have, uh, be somewhat disappointing. <laughs> but um, it's, it isn't even going to be available until March 30 anyway. So 
Pico CTF and these real competitions will be much better for us to practice on. And I, as mentioned before, NCL costs 25 or 35 bucks, so have some money. And um, there are two levels. There's a security plus level and a certified ethical hacker level. So pick one of those levels. And people tell me, uh, Mark's done it a couple of times and he says it is really very, very easy. So we should be able to do pretty well at it. Any other questions? For the yeah. Yeah, it's all online. You don't go anywhere. And it's, they're all free. Uh, well, it's going to go for like 10 days. So just log in and start solving the puzzles, just like you're solving Pico puzzles. So my point is like earlier, you guys are all in depth. Where do you start? You get more time. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. So if you start on Friday when it becomes available, you'll have a few more days, which is fine. You, you yeah. Uh, check them out. You'll find it very much like Pico CTF if it's like in the past, but they're brand new puzzles, and you're actually competing against real people. And you know, we actually got in the top ten for a while in one year. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm assuming at the point of similar Pico CTF, so are we supposed to like share ours with the top, or I, I don't know how it works. Um. <coughs> Well, that's a good question. We could all compete as one team, but I think it would be better if you do it alone or in small groups of two or three, because what happens is uh, in the first day or two, you solve all the easy ones, and then you get to the hard ones that nobody can do. So if everybody's all on one team, most people won't have anything to do. So I think it'd be better to work alone or in small groups uh, with somebody you like to work with. Yeah. Yeah, it's just online. Okay. It's online and free, so you can access it for 10 days. Okay. And uh, I just do it instead of Pico. The Pico is warm up. That's a real competition, which is more fun. And um, we'll, we can do it during class time next week. And we, and we talk to it. But people who've already started will be able to help others solve puzzles and such. Um, I suppose that's technically cheating, but I don't think it matters for us because as college teams, we can't have the prizes anyway. So I mean, there's high school teams who are actually supposed to obey the rules and compete for real cash prizes. And then there's just general login for people who are not high school students who are just doing it for educational value. That's us. And, uh, and we should definitely do it. And really what we're doing is practicing for NCL. But it's also, like I say, this is just a fancy way of tricking people into doing your homework. These competitions will push you beyond, I've learned a lot more cryptography than I ever knew. You know, whatever you know, there'll be challenges prompting you to go further, further in forensics, further in web hacking, you know. So it's very good for you. You know, it's better than homework where you do something and maybe it's too easy for you. Here, you go up to where it's hard and do that one. <clears throat> and these, these ones are good because there's a lot of puzzles with a slowly increasing level of difficulty. So it's not where you're just going to see a bunch of things that are impossible and you can't even learn from. There will be one that's possible but difficult for you, and that's the one you should do. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to shut off the Zoom. Let's go upstairs and do some practice. I want you to solve that uh, Bill and Ted thing um, with Python or any other scripting language that you know, but if you don't know it,